thank God for those railings on those stairs. You know, I would have lost my balance there. I'll come back to that in a, in a bit. So when I started preparing for this evening's uh, talk on being centered, as I kept reading the word centered, the word self-centered kept coming up in, my, in the back of my mind. And I, used, I had to ask myself, we are saying be centered, but are we really saying be self-centered? Students, do you think there's a difference between centered and self-centered? Yes, okay. Some, we know what self-centered means, right? Self-centered is where I am the center of the universe, right? Everything is about me. I am so good that I am, everyone should look up and uh, clap for me. Do you think there should be people like that uh, in this world? Do we know anybody in this world who's self-centered? Parents, children, anyone, anyone. Just put your hands up. If you think you know someone who's self-centered, do any of you think that you are self-centered? Quite a lack of show of hands there. But do you see the dichotomy there, right? We, we, we know that many are self-centered in our circles, but we definitely are not self-centered. Having said that, there are people who have a right to be self-centered. Newborn babies, they truly believe that they are the center of the universe, in which they are at that point in time. Everything in their universe revolves around them. So when you were a newborn baby, it was perfectly all right to be self-centered. Cats are self-centered. I have a cat at home, a Persian. She thinks she's the, the center of the universe. All of us revolve around her. Maybe the peacock. But the rest of us, I don't think, have a right to be self-centered. And therefore, before I go on to the theme of being centered, I want to keep aside the word self-centered. Okay? So now let's go down to what I think uh, centered means. Chris yeah, so there, there are many people like this we know who are heroes who, who take that difficult, difficult walk on a tightrope, yeah? And they carry this huge uh, stick, which I think is actually a load. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Yeah, so that man is carrying a really heavy pole in his hand while he's already doing the difficult task of walking on that wire. I was climbing up these stairs and I was so grateful that there were railings on the side. So students, this is for you. Your school years, your years at home with mom and dad and family around you are like the railings that you had all these years. The school is getting ready, your parents are getting ready to send you out into a world where there may be railings, but more likely as you go on in your professional and your personal life, there may not be railings for you to hold on to the side. All right? So when you then stand there, and if you're standing to lose your balance, something is going to help you. We'll call that the balancing pole. Yeah? We're going to choose our balancing pole today at the end of this talk. So pay attention, and each of you can choose what you think is a good balancing pole for you. But did you see how important that balancing pole was? Even though it seemed like a burden, that is what gave that man stability. If he had to just walk without holding that pole, it is very, very hard, and we could fall. So I think being centered, that image I want you to keep, because you guys are studying for your final exams now. 90% of what I'm going to speak will not stay in your memory. It should not stay in your memory because it's, you're going to put your subjects back onto it. But images stay. That's why I put that image. And I've got two more images for you to remember the balancing pole. So it's going to come there. What is this balance that, on that, for that man, he was balancing between his left side and his right side. Your life is not going to be that simple. At some point, you'll be balancing between happiness, which comes naturally for, at, at some point in time, and sadness. At some point, you'll see your family and you struggling with sickness, maybe, and health on the other side. All right? Struggling with loneliness and also having seen the other side. So the pole will keep you grounded so you know that this is not the only reality in my life that I also have this. Which is why when Sarup sir and the first two girls who did that pessimism and optimistic uh, role play, it, it fitted in so, so well with this. So this pole 
will help us. There are days when you will feel absolute solitude, even though you're surrounded by people. And the other days you will absolutely enjoy fellowship. I wish you both in this life, because everything is a balance. Just remember to keep your pole. There are days I will fail. There are projects I will fail in. There are exams I may fail in. I wish not, but if any of those failures come, you must have your pole ready so you can also balance on to the other side. So success will still call out to you. So remember, so now let's go down to see what other versions of holding a balance or being centered, Chris, could mean. Yeah, so a potter's wheel. A potter's wheel is another very, very good example of being centered. Because when he does whatever beautiful, one more time, Chris, you can play. Yeah. When that wheel is spinning, which is what your life is going to be, no matter what shape you're going to create, that pot of clay, that mud of that, that pot of clay which, which he's molding in his hand, has to be in the center of that wheel. If to start with, if that is off center, if it's weighted to one side, or if his wheel is not balanced, what's going to happen to that clay? What do you think will happen, guys? It'll break, it'll go into a different shape, and then it might just fall off the wheel, especially as it goes round and round. So very, very important to stay in the center. Now, this potter is a very good potter, and this morning he did a beautiful pot, and he centered it well. What about tomorrow? Does he have to center it tomorrow as well? Or is it enough to say, oh, on uh, Wednesday I centered it, so I don't have to center it again? When I center myself using one of the tools we're going to discuss, how often should I center myself, girls? How often? Every day? Okay, what about during the day? In the morning I had, I centered, I was very happy, a big fight with uh, my wife maybe, or my boss, and now I fire at my, my youngsters, and we have a really, or I have a patient who comes in and is very upset, and they completely shake my equilibrium. And then suddenly something new is coming up in the next half an hour. What should I do? Center myself again. So how many times a day? As many times as possible. I was before coming up here, sitting there, centering myself. You know the, the feeling when you go in for an exam, I would, you know how to center yourself. It may be a prayer in your mind, it might be an image of a, of a grandparent who you, or a parent who's supporting you, or if you don't uh, have any of that, it might just be focusing on your breath. Any of these could be your mode of centering. This is true for, for us adults as well as for the students. So we center every day, and we center many, many, many times a day. Chris, sir, one last little clip. Yeah, we all know this doll, yeah? I'm not saying we should be that shaped to say centered. I am definitely not saying that, <laughs> okay? But this is a doll who teaches us a lot, a lot in being centered. Because no matter how much of impact it gets from the left and the right, it rocks and rocks and rocks, and, but still stays upright. When your children, when you are growing up, your parents, your family, your teachers are standing right next to you. So even if something big comes, you are there to support you. But when you're out on your own, you may not have them, but you can still stand like that. That looked funny. Do you know anything else which stands like that, no matter how strong the breeze may come? The trees, the trees also behave exactly the same way as that. They are not like an iron pole. The trees are not like an iron pole. They get swayed, but they still stand. And what is holding them? The root which, is, which they've put in, which they've worked for. Your parents grew your roots for you, but you have to grow it even further and deep, so you stay there. So you've got three examples of centering. One was the tightrope walk with the pole. One was the potter's wheel. And one was the, the doll which can't be pushed down. So now let's move on to what exactly is my pole? Because all, whatever we've spoken till now is good. It's theory. Yeah? But if you're going to go away from this graduation remembering something, it is to find out what is my individual pole? What is your individual pole which you will need to carry? Okay. So what, what could a pole be? For some of us, especially in Bethany, it is faith. Especially faith in God. You've seen that. Most of you have seen that. Your parents have seen that. And is a faith in God. I have two teenagers at home. Once we get past the teenage years and go past graduation, go into degree college, get your early job, somehow that part of it, the faith in God part of it, becomes 
a little pull down in some families and some children because of uh, the age and because of the company. And it's perfectly okay when that happens. God will find you when it's time to find you. So when that happens, children, don't be worried. But faith in God definitely is a very important pole we can have. If you're not in that phase where God still matters that much to you, you will still have your spirituality which will hold you. It could be your faith in family. It could be your faith in, in, in a deep inner silence which you may have. It could be meditation. Choose the one which comes to you. We'll go through a list of them, and then each of you are going to choose three out of the six that I'm going to name. So please listen. It's exam time already. Yeah. So it could be that. It could just be a quiet time in the morning. Just a quiet time. No verbal prayer, no need for any songs. Just a quiet time. Maybe three minutes, maybe five minutes. Many people use that quiet time as their period of centering for the day or even before sleeping. And this is valuable. I think every religious tradition, especially in our country also, thousands of years of quieting down which makes us centered, which they talk about. And I think that's something that we can use. The next thing to use is gratitude. Gratitude, surprisingly, is one of the most balancing thoughts and attitudes that one can have when it comes to being centered. If you can find three things to be thankful for every day before you sleep, you will find that that's a very, actually a shortcut pole which you can use to stay balanced. Three things, it could be anything. Like Akash sir, I'm sure he is grateful for his good looks. Yeah, very few of us can say that, but he, I'm sure he's, he's, he's able to do that. I definitely don't go there. But it could be gratitude for anything which happened in your day, anything which happens in your family, the small things or the big things, but gratitude. So we've, we've mentioned three. We've mentioned faith. Anybody else can remember something else? A quiet time. And we've mentioned gratitude. Okay, let's go on. The other big thing as you grow older is to find your purpose in life. If I have found my purpose in life, that will get me out of bed. That will get me onto the toughest tarmac possible. And that will teach me that unless I'm balanced, I can't achieve anything. Because I have a purpose. You were created for a purpose. You've been through this school for a purpose. Your parents chose this school for each of you for a purpose. And you will find your purpose as you go along. And it will change. When I turned 50, my entire outlook changed. My purpose changed. I had to go back to centering and finding something new. Otherwise, it's going to be a very boring life as we go along. Yeah? And find a passion. The passion is not your profession. Passion is something else which you do. And we've seen such talented children who've come up with their other passions which are there. It's not just hobbies. Your passion might just be helping people. Baby auntie is there. You know what a passion she has for the children that she looks after. And they come back year after year after year. So a passion is about finding something which consumes you. And lastly, the other one is service. You, I'm sure you've seen your parents, you've seen your teachers, you've seen other people in family, or been inspired by someone. The service is something that you can do in your professional career or in your personal career. So no matter what you end up doing, there will always be room for service. Can you quickly go through the six? Because they're going to choose three at the end of the day. Faith, a quiet time, Gratitude, wow, these children are going to score very high in their exams for sure. Purpose, purpose, passion, and service. So you can choose any of these, yeah? So there's no right or wrong which is there. Now, did God make life that life itself is centered? Is your everyday life when you step out going to be centered for you? Not at all. It is not at all designed to be centered. But who has to be centered? It's I who have to center. The responsibility is mine. How often do I do it? I do it every day, many times a day, as much as I need. Okay, so we're coming to the end now. One of the other messages which Sarup sir gave me was the word, uh, I am bound. That will work for us who are sitting in the middle. Try telling any teenager, boy or girl, that you are bound to do this, or you're going to be bound to follow this. What do you think they'll do? Absolutely not. Yeah, that is, that is the natural thing of youth. Most revolutions are led by whom? Not by old men and old women. It's led by young people. All the revolutions in the world, it's the young people. So I replace that word bound with wound. Because wound is easier for us to understand. When we say 
wound, what do you remote, what what are you reminded of? I am reminded of a top I used to play with. Your generation probably used a bay blade or something of that sort. When the last time you sat in an aircraft, you saw the Boeing engine, and you could see that thing going round and round and round. Your physics teachers taught you about potential energy and kinetic energy. All the kinetic energy you need in your career, in your in your professional, your personal life, your relationship. All that energy is going to come from being wound. Even the clock, my old clock which I have in my house, needs to be wound. So that centering happens. And then you wind yourself again, get back your energy. None of this makes sense to the young generation unless you tell them it's their iPad or their phone which needs to be charged. So your quiet time, your pull is getting charged. Okay. So now let's revise and then I'll have a quick word for our parents. So children, out of the six, I'm going to read them one by one. You just shout out the one which appeals to you. Each of you can choose three or all six if you like. Okay, let's go one by one. Faith. Wonderful. And remember this, this is for yourself. You're not screaming it out for your parents to hear or for me to hear or anybody to hear. I want this to resonate with you. Quiet time. Oh, see, a lot of girls want the quiet time. Boys, you're going to be quiet for a long time. Gratitude. Yes, that's among the easiest. So I would say keep that. I think each of you can keep that because gratitude is easy to, to do. There is nothing difficult about giving gratitude in your heart for the things you believe. Purpose. Oh, look at that. The boys are there. Now they're purposefully going up on their, on their audio. Okay? Next one is passion. My goodness, I think I triggered the boys here, I think. Service. Okay, so just remember in your hearts what you spoke of. Parents. Okay, good. Parents, just one, one illustration for you today. I'm sure a lot of you have read Khalil Gibran, the prophet. Yeah, if you haven't, please pick it up. It's a small book of some 45 pages of which 20 pages are big cartoon diagrams. So there's only a few pages to read, and the font is very big, so you'll finish it really fast. The Prophet by Khalil Gibran. In that, when someone asks him, the Prophet, how do we bring up our children? How do we bring up our children? He says, your children do not belong to you. They belong to life. Life has brought them through you. They come through you but they are not you. They are here for a purpose. So he says, I'm paraphrasing, he says, parents are the bow. Like you see Rama's bow now. So it's the bow. And the children are the arrows. Now the bow can only give strength and a lot of push and a lot of thrust to let the arrow go far. But who decides where the arrow will go? The archer. The bow never decides where the archer will go. Try to control your compulsion to decide what your children are going to do. This is what my dream is for my child. Try to get out of that. But the prophet, he said it beautifully. He said, you're the bow. Just pray to the maker that when he pulls the bow, that I am strong enough to not break and give what that arrow needs to go. But don't fall into the trap of deciding that this arrow should not go there, it should go here. And that, I think, is a difficult lesson for us parents to understand. I've been through that difficulty myself, so I'm speaking of this from a very practical point of view. So I would suggest read that book. It's The Prophet by Khalil Gibran. So dear children, I leave you with your pole, which you will carry for the rest of your life. Remember the three things that you're going to use for that. And, and above all, be grateful to your parents, your teachers, and all the people in the school, your non-teaching staff, each of them, you know how passionate they are about your well-being and your education. So keep this in your heart and be connected, as Jim was saying, back to your alma mater. Thank you and God bless.